recording now. Okay. Okay. Um, well, everybody, thank you. Uh, we're excited to be here today. Um, for the next four days, we should be doing hopefully coming doing some interesting work, um, showing you some of the things that we've been working on and helping go through the process of like starting with biopolymer. Um, I think that from like a logistical standpoint, if there's any issues that you have in terms of just like accessing or seeing anything that we're showing, we're gonna be putting duplicates of the lectures as well as anything that we hand out through the Google Drive. So I'm hoping that everybody has access to that Miro board. It has links to the Google Drive as well as the email that was sent out. Um, and those are kind of important links because they're not only just the schedule, which obviously you found if you're here, but we'll be uploading to Miro board as well as um, uploading to drive continually throughout the workshop. Now the Miro board is a place that it's just going to be very collaborative, so you feel free there's slots on there if you want to upload any of the work that you've been working on and want to refer to it. There'll be a support session later in the week. And during that, that's probably a great place to upload uh, images of any of the material testing that you're doing or potential screenshots of any like technical issues you come across. That way there's something that we can like quickly review um, when it's your, your session there. Um, at the very end of the workshop, we're gonna do kind of like a, a share out for anyone who wants to. So the mirror board will also be a great place to upload images or videos that you have. Um, okay, so I think what we'll do here is we're gonna kind of like dive in, but I'm just, Curious, does anybody have any questions or um, any logistical concerns or is everyone good to go? Okay, okay. cool. So I think that uh, it's practically impossible through Zoom for things to feel um, <laughs> loose and open and uh, like a conversation. But this is really like a, a workshop that's designed to try to be um, as informative as possible. Um, which means that we're going to be like rapidly going through some information and that may feel like either we're moving too fast or that there's like questions that you have to get more particular details about things. Even if we're like presenting, let's say, please feel free to just like to speak up. Um, everyone should be in the gallery setting of your Zoom if that's what you're using. That way you can kind of see we're not going to do a full screen outside of what we have, but this should be pretty large in your window. But so when you want to speak, you should, your, your face will kind of like pop up over the presentation. So we'll definitely know that you're talking. <laughs> so feel free to do that anytime. And also, if you don't want to speak out, you can go ahead and jump on live, the um, chat and chat um, anyone who's not speaking at the time between the three of us, and we can respond to you. Uh, any questions you have there, or as also, we'll kind of take a break in between. So let's just go straight into this now. Okay, so first off, um, Andy, are you able to see, does everything look cool? You can see the, the presentation and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, so um, pretty much, let's see here, we are uh, the three of us, um, myself, Paul, and Andrew, uh, who often goes by Andy. So if you hear me say Andy, that's probably why we just <laughs> a little more casual there. Yeah, um, you can use either one. <laughs> we're um, basically the three of us uh, are both uh, like colleagues having like taught and part together through workshops as well as um, come out of like the Los Angeles community of architects um, based around SciArc. And so we have like a lot of um, working experience together. This is the first time that we're formally doing a workshop through Zoom. Uh, usually these are in-person workshops. So um, we have a little bit of experimentation in terms of like how we're going to show the demo. But I think that um, we have a couple of cameras set up and that, that should be interesting. Um, I wanted, before we started, just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background about who we each are. Um, so uh, first, um, you know, all this information is totally available, like um, online, both through the website um, and our, our own personal website. But um, I have my undergrad in ceramics and biogeography um, out of UCLA, and then took some years off after working mostly in like fine art. Um, 
to go into architecture school. Um, that's where I went to the Southern California Institute of Architecture, um, where I got my master's uh, heavy into like computational design. But during that period of time there, I was exposed to some basic robotics. So after having graduated, I spent a few years working in architecture before returning to teach um, in the robotics facility there, in which case the work became primarily around finding ways of using robotics and technology to sort of, um, to sort of uh, tighten the gap between what we were, um, the fabrication processes that we were using and concerns regarding sustainability in nature. So in some cases, it meant reconsidering the way robots can design and help us design um, from a fabrication standpoint in terms of being more sustainable that way. And in other times, it was about setting up like ecologically based projects. Um, and so very, you know, years back, um, Paul and I started a design firm focusing pretty much on expanding that research. Um, and through that, We've done a lot of work with biopolymers um, and different types of like material explorations and different types of emerging technologies. And basically a lot of the work that we were doing in natural based materials is what has kind of culminated into the workshop that we're doing today. So I'm looking forward to being or being here. I'll be talking a lot today, but then we'll switch off later. Um, but I, I look forward to um, meeting everybody. So please, you know, introduce yourselves later or Contact me if you want to, if you have any questions, follow up. And next. I'm uh, Paul Sutherland Santo. Um, as Garrett said, we have a design firm together. Um, you've been receiving emails from me, I assume, uh, since I've been sending them. Um, unlike Garrett and Andrew, my background is actually in the entertainment industry, which is very different, but I would say not, you know, radically different in that we're dealing with a lot of like speculation, um, speculative materials and speculative design. Um, as Garrett said, we work uh, with a lot of robotics and uh, we uh, utilize uh, artificial intelligence in some of our designs and obviously plant-based uh, materials uh, with an eye for aligning technology and nature more closely as we move forward. Um, I won't be speaking a lot during uh, this workshop, but you will be seeing my hands making the uh, biopolymer, the biogels in the live demo and in the video. So you will be seeing me just, uh, just my hands. <laughs> And I'm Andrew DePew. I did my undergrad and my uh, master's in architectural technology, both at SIRE, uh, and then stayed on there to teach a seminar about robotically 3D printing biopolymers. Um, uh, worked with both Paul and Garrett on first taking their workshop and then uh, getting some help with running my own course on this. And uh, happy to be here. Okay, so um, the schedule as we have it is today, uh, we're going to be focusing just on two things. I'm gonna give a short introductory lecture just to brought like a quick survey of work that's being done in biopolymers or natural based materials from other designers that are working sort of like currently, as well as we're gonna go through a demonstration cooking tutorial. That will be something that will also be provided um, as a separate document later that we'll upload to the drive so you can refer to at that time. Later in the week, um, well, actually starting tomorrow, that is, we're going to totally switch over solely into Rhino and Grasshopper. That's when we're going to take basically the cooking tutorial logics that we've done and then start to apply them and see how dig their digital components will be working. That's essentially to create the tool paths and to be able to design tool paths from two-dimensional images. And um, from there, for anyone who needs to on Wednesday, and this is an optional section, We'll be offering support sessions for anything that we've discussed, whether that's you're trying to make, you know, you're experimenting with material explorations at home and you're hitting some obstacles and you need some um, advice on how to move out of that or different ways to consider moving forward with your own research, um, as well as like very technical questions regarding the gra grasshopper or the rhino workflows. We'll conclude on Saturday, um, the 29th. And essentially at that time, we're gonna have an opportunity to share out this workshop is obviously designed around both producing material, the workflow, and then being able to 3D print that material. But we realize that what that means is that there are certain types of like 
um, hardware requirements that aren't necessarily something that's available to everybody. In particular, desktop, a desktop 3D printer, extruders, and in larger cases, robotics. So because we know that most people don't have access to that, what we're going to do is, for anyone who's interested, um, we're going to take sample toolpaths that you've made during this workshop and then live stream print them on our own um, augmented desktop printer and extruder with the biogels that we're going to be teaching you to make. So um, there'll be, we'll, we'll see how many of those we get and see how many that we can print. But essentially, it's an option for anyone who doesn't have access to the hardware now. OK. Um, what well, we're basically the workflow as we show it here. Uh, I just want to be super clear for anyone who didn't see like the preview. Uh, we're making the biogel for extrusion. It's not mandatory. If you can make it at home and you have the ability to get the ingredients if you haven't already, this would be a perfect opportunity to do that, get some testing done so we can help with any troubleshooting that you may hit just initially out the gate. Um, and then from there, we're going to get all the way through the workflow process, export to G-code. G-code is an option to be able to go to both 3D printers and robotics with the intention of being able to give you the full end-to-end -end idea, at least in concept of how you would go from making the material, producing the workflow, and then printing the material. Now, um, this is all information you can look at later, but basically just the learning objectives are pretty clear. What I've already mentioned It is just worth mentioning that about most of what we're going to be doing is in Grasshopper and Rhino. So if you haven't already, please make sure that you've got that downloaded and installed as we'll be starting tomorrow with that. Now, this workshop um, for us comes from a very personal place. I think that one of the things that we're going to be talking maybe a lot about during this time is overcoming the obstacle of perceiving that what you need is a expensive setup and expensive facilities in order to conduct and begin actual forms of research. For us, and not just us, but in the general understanding that essentially the future really does belong to biobased materials. And essentially for us, the idea that things in the future, oh, you know, basically the integration of biological process and design are facilitating an evolution of more complex relationships between our built and natural worlds. And so what you're going to see in examples like this are like the ability to use and alter biomaterials in a way that really do expand and produce a library and a new material class. That material class is one where we're going to be able to augment performance. Now, part of that, and this is Andy here <laughs> in the image, is actually as designers leveraging the opportunity to not only design the base materials that we use, but also design them in parallel with the workflows that we use them with, not only to optimize the performance of the two, but also to really leverage the way that the deposition of certain materials can influence the performance of the biopolymers that were being printed. Now, biopolymers are just one aspect of the types of biomaterials that are going to be out there. So, you know, the question is for a lot of people, like what exactly are bio-based materials? In general, and while this is broad and continuing to um, so you maybe become more specific. These types of materials are, liter are, are usually just things that contain substances or made of substances that are directly from living matter. Now, our workshop is going to be based solely in plant-based materials and plant-based starches for biopolymers. But there is an entire world out there of designers who have been working and exploring and experimenting in bio-based design in a broader sense. So before we kind of jump into being a little bit more specific about the projects that we've done in the past, I wanted to just show you some examples of sort of uh, designers who are pushing into new territories, exploring sustainability, performance, and aesthetics. Um, as since a lot of the a lot of designers nowadays have the freedom to be able to explore. Um, I think that for most people, um, this is some this is a project that happened years back, High Five New York, basically a mycelium-based project. As a lot of you know, digital futures is based in architecture. I think there's been an interest in figuring out how we can move some of these like natural materials into architectural settings. This is true for also seeing like the mycelium pavilion and explorations in 3D printing myce mycelium by altering and printing substrates. Now I'm going quickly through this because it's just going to be like a quick survey. There are annotations here so that you could read, you could look into any of these projects if you find them interesting. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm also happy to expand on any of these individual projects kind of at the end. But one thing I did want to note here is that in the top right hand corner, you can see that there's a very common um, manual method of being able to both test things using like handheld syringes, making materials basically in a simple facility on a small area, testing out a single variable, like in this case, 
testing whether or not the mycelium matrix can be stacked before moving into like a more robotic transitionary process. That's all to say that while um, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done on individual designers, there's also larger companies. Um, you may have seen very recently, I believe it was a Prada bag that was first made of a mycelium-based um, leather alternative. This is one large company that's producing that now. Now, another aspect of um, biomaterials in general is also like the ability to produce um, earth-based 3D printing that sustains life in, in for bioreceptive means. Projects like this um, can house either from either ceramics or in the example of Ecologic Studio here, become functioning as a scaffold for living organisms. Now that extends also to the Bartlett, um, which is in the BioD program that was producing and exploring the way to use hydrogels infused within like grooves produced from ceramic tiles. And the idea there being that since it's based in London with a significant amount of rain, uh, as rain cross or passes over the exterior facade of this building with embedded hydrogels, the hydrogels are pulling out toxins from inside the water source and purifying. This was a um, this is an, an example also of algae work. This is actually Andy's project um, that he worked on with a team that was both embedding ceramics and um, that was like robotically altered and glazed with um, tubes of algae for proposal for the exterior of a building to which would produce um, basically like algae growth, either for the purposes of being used in a restaurant or for uh, actual production of energy. Now in more manual means, there's work that's being done in all types of different uh, cyanobacterias, bacterias producing outcomes of leathers, this actually is a modern synthesis just I think got a formal studio and opened up and are expanding their materials. And bacteria as a form of producing pigmentation. As you see in these examples of like these stained E. coli colored um, uh, garments and bacteria that's being used for the purposes of causing like transformations over time, where the actual bacteria in this Ginkgo Bioworks residency is um, using, is basically altering, degrading a biopolymer um, brown, let's just call it like, um, it looks, it's like a, it's like a sheet material of some sort. I um, mean, then over time, you can see like this like form expands, become larger as it reacts against the bacteria. And then this form of research was sort of taken to be able to take something that was printed flat and allow changes in the lamination of the material to produce an automatic three-dimensional shape. Now, this is a particularly interesting project because well, although it is based in a different type of biopolymer classes than what we're using, the logic is the same in that we're laminating, they're laminating two layers of different types of material and the outcome is, is out of the byproduct of the deposition of the second layer, meaning that there's a graded nature to this. The, tool, the two layers function together to produce a new outcome. Um, and then, you know, there's extra facades, uh, facades made of biochar and um, tiles being made from silk of cocoons. Um, these cocoons are broken down and basically turned into what this individual calls biosilk and spider web clothing. So, I mean, you know, there's like this list continues on and on using different types of methods of compressing material to sheet material logic like you see here in this like collagen based bioplastic garment. So the form that any of these biopolymers take have a lot to do with the way that they're both utilized and the way that people are researching into different areas like Claire Davis into um, sodium silicates. For anyone who like goes on design boom, this is a project that was shown quite a while back. These are actually like testing um, different biolumin or sorry, iridescence that comes from cellulose based sequence. And in this particular case, the research was like focused primarily on how a biopolymer can have a structural, uh, a microscopic structural texture, and that texture reflects light. And lastly, example, or and to conclude, or kind of just like loop back here, back to sheet materials using similar biopolymers to what we're going to be using in this um, workshop, you can see uh, lots of sheet materials and small samples that have been um, util utilizing different vegetable, um, I guess you would just call it a byproducts. And then finally, the um, Oxman labs at MIT, uh, the Media Matter Lab, and then I guess what's now known as Oxman, 
uh, working with like multi-structural 3D printing, where in this particular case, this is very close to lots of what we're going to be speaking about in regarding trans mapping over performance through multi-material printing for the purpose of having structure where you need to and having um, membrane in other areas where structure isn't quite required. And images such as this, where you see in this case, a multi-material printing gel liquid um, is certainly in the region of things that we'll be discussing. <clears throat> now there are like advancements in like actual living organisms yet again. Um, her studio was working, did a, did a small project or an exploratory project with Puma, questioning whether or not like live bacteria embedded into biomaterials could actually respond to things like human sweat and then degrade biopolymer and open and perforate to allow air circulation in wearables. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of projects out there. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen this yet, I would advise that if you want more exposure to different types of biomaterial projects that exist, that you check out uh, Future Materials Bank. This is a program that's continually expanding sort of their library of existing projects. Um, and I think at this point, there's somewhere close to almost 400 different projects worldwide. And they have an actual physical location um, for anyone who happens to be in Europe uh, and around where you can go and you can actually see a lot of these samples. Now, sort of shifting back over to like where it is that we, where we work, um, it's really like worth noting that a lot of the work that we did originated in like very simple, very loose and very rough testing. And it's all about figuring out what kind of variables that you want to test. Now, today we're going to be giving you a base formula. That base formula is actually the formula that was used to produce these three samples that you see here. And we'll also be giving you the, care, the ability to decide how to start customizing that biomaterial to change things like opacity and flexibility. Now, in this particular case, our documentation becomes a means for us to document not only the way that we explore um, work, sorry, I just have somebody I need to, uh, not only how we explore, but also the way that we can like start to track whether or not certain formulas are producing consistencies for instance, does a certain type of starch base give us more opacity? And does the inclusion of a different additive start to alter the way that the, that the um, biopolymer functions? And in this particular case, we started to explore whether or not it was possible to alter the biopolymer such that we can not only control whether or not it was particularly flexible, but also alter its um, opacity. In this case, we are adding in um, biochar. The biochar not only like changed in some instances, just like the translucency, but it also in this instance of this like really like middle um, example here, everyone can see my uh, mouse, right? Yeah, cool. Okay, in this example here, it actually made change the surface texture. And oddly enough, making small alterations allowed us to keep not only the opacity, but also can change the surface texture back to something that was smooth. And we'll be discussing that logic a bit later as well. Now, quickly coming out of um, hand testing, we started to explore ways of digitizing the process in order to begin to um, narrow in and systematically test and evaluate what success ratios and validations, and also explore multi-material printing, which in the case of the image on the right, is a black uh, insert inside of a clear biopolymer base. In order to do that, we were testing, uh, we actually needed to, uh, I don't know, get, find a way to extrude three-dimensionally. So we ended up having access to a CNC gantry. So we were able to take a extruder, um, which nowadays there are a lot of plans actually out there to be able to like make your own customized paste extruder. And we was able to use 3D printing mounts to basically hack the CNC into a large format 3D bioprinter. Now, after doing that, we started to become able to really like tailor in exactly what kind of tool paths that we wanted to do, in part because since we weren't doing it manually anymore, you could have a repetition, do thousands and thousands of different small movements in order to achieve different things like different textures or different patternings. But in order to really process that many waypoints or that many target locations, we needed to start exploring in Grasshopper means of automating the way that we produce tool paths. And in the image of what you see, or in the video of what you see here, uh, I'm going to come back to this. This is actually a two-dimensional image. That two-dimensional image's pixel data is informing the prioritization of what is being printed first 
In this case, everything that was a black pixel was being printed in black, and everything that was a white pixel was not being printed. And we used shades of gray to start to articulate different ways, in this case blue, um, that the extruder would move to produce texture. Now, that worked pretty well, and we were pretty happy with it. So what we were able to do now for the first time is sort of like scale up and move into like furniture size pieces, um, exploring the way that we could take multiple formulas um, of different sort of performance, let's say rigid, which is indicated in red and like the first image to the left here. Uh, this would all be sort of like a rigid skeleton frame, a second biopolymer that was a semi-rigid that basically provide, we saw it a lot as like cartilage. <laughs> and the uh, third, which was essentially infilling to provide more surface area for sitting. That actually worked quite well. So there's like basically three three layers of different type of three biopolymers that are each printed on top of each other that all follow tool paths that have been generated through both Rhino and Grasshopper. And in this particular case, this is an image of the tool path that produced the stool that you just saw, where what's indicated in black here is rigid, semi-rigid, and medium gray, and then, then the lightest is actually a flexible membrane. And this is a close-up detail of that sort of that image. And it's worth noting that something that was significant to us was the fact that if you were to like cut into this with a pair of scissors, you would see a cross section that's continuously variable, where you have thickness where you need it, and you have thinness where you don't need any structural integrity. And that for us was not only a move toward, let's say, um, more sustainable means of not using material where we don't need to, but it was also an exploration for us to produce a method that doesn't require adhesives or glues to glue together multiple layers, as well as to start exploring ideas of um, fully composite biomaterials. Now, you know, we began originally these like simple questions, like these simple tests of biopolymer because we were living in Los Angeles and getting pretty tired of like getting, trying to order 3D printing filament and it only being like plastic options. And then in addition to that, walking down the streets of LA and just seeing plastic strewn about, like all over the place. And we thought to ourselves was, uh, you know, in the context of architecture and producing prototypes and like mass producing different tests, we really couldn't like look past the fact that we were producing so much plastic waste, even, you know, under the guise of like producing a new design. So, uh, you know, our move was a very personal one to try to like figure out how just to reduce the amount of like disposable plastics that would enter into our like oceans. But after we started exploring multi-material printing and we realized that, you know, the biopolymer could really function as a matrix to be able to embed new performance to it. So that began like a line of research where we were testing different methods of, in of, of putting in filtration agents into the matrix of the biopolymer for the purpose of like allowing the surface of the biopolymer to do things like in this case, absorb CO2 and VOCs using similar methods to how activated carbon and um, functions inside of like pre-existing filtration units. So multi-materiality at this point then became a method where we were like not only controlling where things were thick and thin, where things were rigid and um, and more and function more like a membrane with through flexibility, but also where performance was. So we used a lot of the same logics of how we were using two dimensional images to start exploring how we could we could take grayscale images and also use the color pixels to produce um, distributions of activated carbon infused um, scrubbing biopolymer as opposed to areas that wouldn't be. And in addition to this, we also were being pretty cognizant of the fact that it we're, we were producing something that was supposed to be an alternative to petroleum-based plastics. But in order for that to really have an effect on the environment in any really substantial way, it meant like distributing this knowledge and like allowing as many people as possible to start to explore it. But if it required like heavy amounts of like really explicit coding, that might become a barrier for people to actually be able to utilize this information and test for themselves. So part of the grasshopper definition that we're going to be providing you and the one and that, that was made and came out of this research was about being able to take simple machines like 3D printers and turn them into bioprinters and be able to use simple workflow methods like taking two-dimensional images and have it automatically produce a toolpath 
as opposed to needing to be able to script those things explicitly through, let's say, G code. Now, that research led to what became a project that became known as Bioscales. Essentially, it was a wall cladding system where the biopolymer itself actually scrubbed um, the air to which whatever surface it was applied. It was originally designed as a means to like increasing surface area on unused wall space, whether like it's up in the walls, ceilings, or tile cladding. Now this uh, was essentially a, a means, oh, back here I should say like the, the way that you distributed black and clear was totally like an aesthetic choice. And so part of the research was proving out that we would be able to take like different distributions of two-dimensional images, in this case, like what's denoted at the bottom as ABCD, are the, the four individual um, pieces that were each printed. And we ran structural, basically we wrote simulation protocols that would try to test and anticipate based on how much black or how much of the rigid material and how much of the flexible material and distribution would change the way that these what, scales would hang off the wall. And that in this way, we were able to really explore the effect of multimateriality on the aesthetic of, of the surface cladding. And this resulted in these pieces. And we kind of just, we take a lot of video and a lot of images to sort of be able to later explain not only what we do, but its importance. And in this case, this video is showing basically what it is, the, the biodegradability of these biopolymers. Again, this is the same biopolymer base that we're gonna be going over today. So everything that we produce, because it's made of a basically plant-based starch, can be easily biodegraded. This is in direct opposition to many of the biodegradable options that you see nowadays. Um, although a lot of cups and things that have been like, are that are claimed to be bio-based, um, are made of, of um, more sustainable materials. They actually require a significant amount of heat and a significant, for a prolonged time before they can actually break down. Our goal here in making this biopolymer is actually to be backyard biodegradable. And the biodegradability concept was based solely off of an exploration into what natural carbon cycles in our environment do, in which case carbon that's, or you know, airborne carbon, which is generally released in the form you know, of CO2 through the ground, usually gets absorbed through plants and then biodegrades in, back into the ground. The largest you know, carbon sink that we have in this planet is actually the earth. Uh, the soil itself. So in this particular case, after having made the biopolymer be capable of absorbing CO2, it essentially can be backyard composted, just being exposed to rain and water. Um, and then that way it would transfer the CO2 and carbon back into the soil for storage. Now that form of research actually is what um, led us to get a, a basically a design grant from the Lexus Design Awards where we're able to take that information um, and formalize it into a project that became known as Biocraft. And this process, this video that's kind of like playing here is an example of much of the process that we're gonna be doing, which is loading biogel into a paste extruder and then using like customized tool paths to be able to print out um, highly unique and individualized pieces that have both graphic and color um, as well as like changes in distribution of, of structural material and be able to like fully just like 3D print um, sample swatches. This is like a pretty clear example of how we've like sort of developed a workflow that would take graphics as a means for like sequencing. So what we mean by that is that the way the order that the, the toolpath follows, the way that it prints, actually results in a pattern that's embedded in the material itself. We were like pretty aware that, especially at this time that we were doing this, that biomaterial was associated very heavily with things that were like off color green. <laughs> that's like, you remember like that kind of like look of like, oh, that's, that's made of like biomaterial because it looks that way. And in the event that we were able to actually produce a material that could be deployed on a mass scale, let's say, um, replacing single-use plastics in a grocery store. Um, if that were to be true, you would still need to be able to like print um, or print in color, put on logos, things that would be necessary for like mass manufacturing of any particular item. And um, we thought, well, instead of like producing a biopolymer and using the, content, the current method where you would take a, a, a substrate and then you would have to use pigments or inks to print 
logos and things onto it, but you'd be able to actually just print those types of graphics and patterns into the material itself when it's being made and thereby reducing the amount of energy that's required to actually print onto it. And maybe it's not a full one-to-one, -one. like maybe you don't get like the resolution of text, but it would at the least be able to reduce the reliance on harmful pigments that are currently used to be printed on, type, on top of plastics and need to be sealed and coated even on cardboard boxes. So these were presumed, like these are a couple of tests of just changing like the different additives and the different effects that this had on this. And this is an image that we'll revisit back later of, uh, of the tool path that was used to produce this actual particular swatch. Now, in addition to considering additives as something that's supposed to stay in, we also began to explore the possibility of embed embedding nutrients into the biomaterials as a means to putting um, necessary like nutrients into depleted soils when biodegraded. So this video, although I think it stopped, is actually a close-up image of, of, um, of nutrients that are inside of a, basically this is in a liquid, with an accelerated speed. So you can actually see as the material biodegrades, it's release of, um, of these elements back into the water source. So uh, we produce a library of materials using all those types of techniques. And for the sole purpose of being able to catalog and clearly explain and, um, and demonstrate control over our ability to alter materials as expected, we produced a library grid on um, that library grid was demonstrated not only the correlation between rigidity, flexibility, and our ability to control that, but also shows the different types of pigments that can be added into it and the aesthetic effect effects of different methods for printing. So in some cases, it's like highly, highly articulated lines, and in other cases, it's produced as sheet materials that have self-leveled. So this basically is a representation of a lot of the materials that we have. Um, and we took this information and did a workshop at SIRE, um, actually with Andy, that um, explored this a little bit further. So students in this particular case, this is Andy's project here, um, used this method of producing tool paths that would biogel print uh, multi-materials. In this case, the dark on top is like a fiber-based, um, let's just call it a more slightly more rigid material. And everything that's translucent and colored below it is all pigmented, but otherwise um, the clear base formula. So you can see the basic setup here. In this case, it's a robot, um, but whether or not it's a 3D printer or some other means, it still uses essentially a paste extruder. And that paste extruder is coordinated to, to push out material in the quantity, the volume that is required and the speed that's required so that as the machine moves, the, um, the material is deployed into these like nice beads um, that mimic or can be simulated to some degree by the grasshopper toolpath. Here's like sort of an example of the outcome from that. And these materials as they set and dry, here's a pretty clear example of like a laminated multi-material with a, a fiber-based clear in the background or white in the background. And then on the top, the blue layer that conforms to it. And then this was just like a simple example of a type of script that Andy put together to auto-generate a fairly unlimited number of options that are each unique that could then be automatically printed. Okay, so like toward the end of sort of like the Lexus um, exploration, it's funny, we had produced this like material library and you know, uh, we'd shown it and they responded back to us being like, well, what can you make from it? <laughs> and we we're like, well, I don't know. It's felt like a lot of work. You know, we were pretty happy with just like the materials themselves, but they really, really wanted something. So we we're like, okay. So we went back to like considering how aggregates could actually create different um, consistencies. In this case, a fiber-based aggregate allowed for, the, allowed for this like thick paste-like moldable form all to the far left. The biogel as we had used it functioned fairly well as something that could coat uh, be coated either on top of the fiber base or in some other means, as well as exploring um, ways of introducing gas into it to produce foam. Between this led us to produce a couple outcomes. This is these are biotiles. They're essentially molded from that fiber-based form in a silicon mold. 
And then after completed, they're individually coded with biogel. And each uh, and the biogel in this particular case is all carbon sequestering. So actually, in a way, this is like the older brother of the bioscales, where we finally produce like a scale, like a, a type of wall cladding that would actually be that would help purify. Um, and then in the event that you didn't want to use them any longer, you could backyard biodegrade them. In addition to that, we use the three layers to produce a furniture piece to be able to demonstrate that the fiber based core would be possible of holding weight. So the design of this product is actually that the middle of it is a core of the foam. We actually um, did a combination of like 3D printing and producing blocks of biopolymer that when then CNC milled. And then that came together to produce the stool. And because we were like exploring at the same time new types of technologies, I mean, this was a few years back and like StyleGAN 2 a, like had just come out. And we were like, which is a, which is like a, uh, from NVIDIA as a means to produce like a neural network that we could train ourselves. And explorations there allowed us to start to consider whether or not surface texture or the quantity of surface that's being exposed to the air could, could influence the amount of carbon that was being pulled out of the air. So at the same time that we were developing um, the stool, the design of the stool, there became a question about like, the relationship between comfort and the performance in terms of like how it would extract CO2 by pure amounts of surface area. So in this particular case of the seat that you can see here that there's actually, we took seat pressure maps, which are to the far left and projected them into a neural network that had been trained on like, like deep um, uh, patterning from nature that Who's like that was like, these were outcomes basically of it just without the projection of like the seat um, pressure maps. But you can see how like they're like they imply a really three dimensional form. At the time, the best way we found out how to three dimensionalize this was actually just to use pixel values to change height values. And what we did is after projecting in the um, seat pressure maps, we would get back this like this hybridization of areas that were more filled in for the purpose of like providing more support and comfort. And then areas for the periphery where you wouldn't apply that much pressure were highly articulated to increase surface area and to perform better. So this is actually a video stringing together something like about a thousand of the three-dimensional outcomes from this. And then that's the, we use this then, um, at some point, you know, we just picked one that we liked because <laughs> it was like, they were all based off of different seat different seat configuration. Here's like sort of a grid of some of some of the outcomes that came from um, weighing that neural networks interpretation of a three-dimensional pattern against each of the seat pressures and like the aesthetic outcome that comes afterwards. Um, and then we printed one. And that became carbon stool, which you see here. Now we're coming sort of like to the end where I kind of want to like wrap up so we can move on. But I did want to show you like that we've been exploring a lot lately with also starting to produce composites of biomaterials with other types of materials. And in this particular case, we were, we were considering the idea that not everything needs to be fully biodegradable. And that although it's like a really intriguing idea to replace single use plastics, and that is one particular use case, it doesn't make like a ton of sense to always produce, let's say furniture um, and have it and, and start to propel or perpetuate an idea that we want to continually produce things just to throw it out. And you don't have to feel bad about it because it's biodegradable. Ultimately, the most sustainable action would be to keep things <laughs> or at least be able to keep portions of things and reuse them without needing post-processing. So this project um, was actually a combination of, of a skeleton of reusable ceramic composites, um, prints, sorry, components. And then there would be biopolymer that would essentially attach all these pieces together. Here's sort of like an example of, this is a 3D printed ceramic. So it's always worth noting that we are doing biopolymers for pretty much all the logics <laughs> of dealing with like imprinting these biopolymers and producing tool paths also can be immediately applied to any other form of paste. There would need to be alterations and you would need to like figure out the right sort of like um, material mixture. But in this particular case, this was a medium fire stoneware um, that was, printed flat, and then it was onto a form and then folded upright and then fired. 
And then that form was registered in the computer. And then the row, we had robots print essentially the exterior component to it. Now, what the idea is, is that when this is to be disposed of, uh, these ceramic components would actually naturally disassemble as a biomaterial that's holding them together would biodegrade, uh, allowing you to then reuse these components in other um, designs. And it could be that you decide, ah, actually, I don't want a gray, you know, design. I'd like something that's colored. <laughs> so instead of throwing out the entire thing, you can reuse components. Um, we're currently working on a project right now that's like exploring a bit of like AI reinterpreting images. Uh, I kind of just breeze past this because we're in the middle of it, but I think what's most compelling as we move into talking about how to produce biopolymer is that through this project, we are really able to explore with a through a collaboration with an artist, um, Sasha Fishman, um, different types of color and pigmentation and micro and micro patterns that come out. These were all done in petri dishes, why, which is why they're all sort of like rounded. But you can see like there's a vast number of different patterns that can come out of just the way that you mix the material, as well as figuring out ways that patterns can emerge naturally from the material as opposed to ones that have to be explicitly printed. And these are just some examples of like a material library that's been in progress uh, currently now. So to sum up, one thing that we really wanted to hit home as we move forward is that there is, there is constantly always a barrier in place between new designers and who wanna go after types of work like biopolymer, thinking that you don't have the correct facility or you don't have like the correct resources in order to start exploration. And, um, and I think that it's really important to us, as you hopefully saw in like the earlier portion where I was showing you some of the original samples, that sometimes doing things manually and testing things and just embracing the fact that like the DIY spirit, the idea that you can, you can make simple tests at home, begin to set up like a design of experiments that allows you to test simple ideas. Like, can I change from one color to another color? Um, can I laminate two layers of different colors? What does that affect? And what we're gonna do is really try to talk about how you could set up these design of experiments so that when you're ready, you can move over into more advanced facilities and have your research transfer over with just a higher degree of precision. Okay, so having said all that, um, I wanna be clear that essentially if we're hoping that everyone will be able to produce um, some swatches at the end of this, or at least allow us to be able to print some for you. So we can really kind of see, and you end up with an example similarly. Um, we're gonna go through the process, but we're gonna tomorrow be handing out a PDF of sort of like a design of experiments for you to test a matrix for you to test yourself, as well as we'll be giving a Rhino file of the extent that we can print, which is about 17 by 20 centimeters for this workshop. They're kind of small so that we can get through as many as we can track. Um, but if you have any questions about the workshop outcomes, let's, let's talk. But before, I want to hit home a couple last things. This workshop is going to require that you have Rhino 7 and Grasshopper. We've already been contacted about those who have, who have Rhino 6. We are going to be providing um, down-saved versions in Rhino 6, but uh, we can't fully guarantee all compatibility. Um, hardware, please let me know or any of us know if you intend during this workshop to use uh, a 3D printer or a robot or something of your own. So we just are aware and can sort of like address those particular questions as needed. Um, and from terms of software, the only reason we have Photoshop on here is so that when we, we set up the grasshopper definition to try 2D images, you have the ability to just alter that image simply, even if that means just using like the paint feature <laughs> uh, to be able to create regions of different types of materials. And we've included on the end of this links, which I will also move the links over to Miro. Um, you'll need two plugins, Anemone and Pufferfish. Anemone does, the last time that Anemone was put out, uh, was released was years ago. I wanna say it's like 2015, but it still works in Rhino 7. The only reason we're using Anemone is because it allows a looping function 
so that those who don't know Python or different ways of producing loops in Grasshopper, they can, you know, you can use this plugin as an easy way to use uh, components that are already native to Grasshopper to create um, looping functions. And then last but not least, if anyone has is starting to get to know Grasshopper and hasn't already kind of explored these three resources, um, I, I think you should. I am not, um, I, I have no like, I'm not, I'm not making any statement about whether or not you should or shouldn't be on Facebook, but there is a group there <laughs> in case you, you are. And they do actually put up quite a few interesting um, tutorials for free. Okay, so uh, I guess this would be a good time to, to stop for a moment. And does any, if anyone has any questions, this would be a good time to address those. Okay, cool. Well, then let's do this. Let's take like um, a, I think we can do a 10 minute break. And then we'll come back on here to move over to the demo. Cool. Um, Andy, did I, was there anything that I missed or did you want to say before we jump off? Um, uh, there's not much that I can think of right now. No. Um, I think the only thing is for those plugins, maybe just so that everybody has the same versions, uh, I've put together a zip folder that already has the plugins in there for you guys. So I can just, we can send that out and then later on when we go over that, uh, you can use that for the installation if you don't already have Anatomy and Popperfish. Okay, great. Okay, so let's uh, come back at 1110. See you all then. Okay, I've resumed recording. Welcome back. Okay, so I have to say, I was curious, uh, I think the three of us are, um, about whether or not, before we start this um, biogel demonstration, anybody's ever already explored with some biomaterials of some sort or tried anything on their own that they'd like to share. So if you do, it'd be great if you wanted to just unmute and go ahead and introduce yourself and just let us know what you've already done. It'd just be kind of cool to see what's already out there. Also welcome to let me know if there's anything in particular. Oh yeah, please. Uh, hello, my name is Alexandra. Um, I was working with algaes, but not uh, as some type of material. We just used it in a briefing mask using some silicone stuff. And it was a bit like soft robotics, uh, if you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we just we made an apparatus to produce algae to make them um, like du duplicate themselves. And then we just made some electricity from um, uh, from uh, from algae uh, and photosynthesis. Um, yeah, this was a project. That's amazing. That sounds great. What was um, and and was the it was producing energy for the mask or was this separate projects? Uh, yeah, for the mask. Uh, we didn't invent any way how to use this uh, energy, but it, it was, you know, it was educational project. So we just had to uh, make this, um, like try to make this te technology, which was inv invented by Paolo Bambelli. Um, he, he invented how to uh, make electricity from uh, the process of photosynthesis. Oh, great. Andy, that sounds like something you might be really into. <laughs> I was uh, curious at looking. I think uh, there was another project that I saw that that also used al like a small algae farm to power um, just basically a, a, like a small computer. But I think uh, I would be definitely curious to look up that. So you said uh, Paolo Bambelli? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah. That's, and then for the mask, was the algae held in some kind of like a gel to suspend it or it was like flowing through the mask? Uh, like going through the mask uh oh. it was a bit speculative like we uh, imagined the future world where you have no uh, access to um to good quality um oxygen so you, you need to use the mask uh, just to breathe it was before covid 19 so it, it it wasn't connected with um epidemic or something like that cool that sounds like a that sounds like a cool uh, a super cool project. You know, um, Alexandra, if you wouldn't, if you want to, you can throw up some samples of what you have your pictures and you can throw them on the mural board. I'm sure everyone would be pretty interested to see what you're talking about. Okay, I will share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Was there anybody else who wanted to share anything or? Feel free to bring up, uh, if you don't want to share, you could also just let us know if there's anything in particular you're interested in, and then that way we can kind of address that as we're, we're talking. Yeah, it looks like we're missing Joe McCallum today. Which, uh, they have uh, some cool biomaterial kind of samples up on the mirror already. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, please, if you if you want to, jump in at another time. Otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and get going. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over here. So we're doing something a little fun this time. <clears throat> We've never done a cooking demonstration like this um, on Zoom. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead. So like we set up a few cameras here. So I'm gonna switch over now. You can see we're gonna kind of move over to this view. So You'll see there's Paul over there. <laughs> Maybe you can duck down and say hi. <laughs> and uh, and you have two views, one directly over the cooking surface that he'll be using, um, which in this particular case is just a propane. Propane? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pro but butane. Like a you know, butane portable stove uh, with an open flame. And then um and then the other view is just so you get like a larger working space, uh, a view of his space. So this is definitely going to just be like, we're gonna walk through the process. And then while we're walking through the process, we're gonna do a demonstration. A um, Couple quick things before we get into it. One, just wanna make sure like we, you understand essentially what we're doing here is we're reviewing a, a simplified version. <clears throat> This can always be expanded on, and we're going to talk through as we go through the demo exactly where there are areas that you can alter. Um, but it's worth noting that the re the way we got to what we're presenting now is we probably made something like I want to guess somewhere between two and two hundred and fifty tests of our own, uh, where what we were doing was essentially just mixing things together, trying if it looked good. We tried to like alter a variable. Maybe we add a little more starch, take a little bit away. And we were like testing to try to like narrow down how to get a, a functioning biopolymer. In this particular demo, the biopolymer that we're showing can certainly be applied to things like sheet materials, but it has been designed to work with extrusion. So it means that it, we're gonna do some, we're gonna show you some validation videos, but that's essentially what this is um, geared toward. Also just keep in mind, it's gonna be messy, so that's totally fine. <laughs> and uh, because of that though, you may wanna have some extra material around. So in the event that you skip a step or something goes a little bit wrong, you have some extra material to play with. We're gonna give you the recipe. And when you have the recipe, one suggestion might be um, starting with like a smaller batch. Um, and we'll talk about that, but it's just a methodology so that that way, if you do have, a problem, you're not wasting too much material. And then above all, which is something we're going to continually say over and over again, is do not be afraid to fully fail. Part of the reason I said 200 to 250 tests is because I'd say about 150 to 200 of them were terrible. <laughs> Absolute failures. So just keep going at it. Um, but part of the support session and what we're here during this week is that we are here and available. So if you do hit a problem, 
we can maybe shorten and reduce the amount of samples that you have to do <laughs> to try to get something that's fully functioning for you. Um, so objectives in this case, what we want you to do is we just want you to be introduced to this process. And we want you to understand that, uh, that you have at your disposal this, um, we're gonna provide a PD or basically a copy of this presentation. You'll have the recording. Uh, and so that you have the foundational knowledge. So even if you don't have the ability to start testing with materials immediately or, or you don't intend to, you have this, these resources so that later in the events that this is something that becomes more relevant to you or you'd like to explore on a different, in a different setting, um, you can do that at any time in the future. Uh, our ultimate belief here, which is I know shared by Digital Futures, is that we really should be in a collaborative world. This knowledge we're making known and we're teaching people to try and we're hoping that if this is something that you feel influenced by that you'll also explore this work and share it with other people so that the more individuals and designers who are thinking more sustainably and understand materials are ultimately going to be sort of like the next generation and wave of designers who are going to change the way that we inhabit this planet. So I really do believe that this is an opportunity um, um, to be more community oriented than uh, individualistic in your, your findings. So uh, this is just the structure. We're gonna go through kind of a quick background and then we're gonna do the material preparation. Where the material preparation will be for a base gel. Then we're gonna show you how to customize that base gel in three sort of like categories of aggregate additives, pigments and dyes, then granules, and then finally using fibers. And with all of this, you should have a full understanding, a working knowledge, let's say, of how you can test any kind of pigment, granule, or fiber that you encounter and want to explore. Uh, we'll cover validation methods so you can know how, or at least what we're looking for when we're making sure that it's 3D printable. And then last but not least, a little quick conversation about like how to set up your experimentation so that you yield results that you can use. So what we're making today is this sticky white stuff. <laughs> Basically, this is, uh, it comes out, it, it looks currently white, but it actually, when it dries, um, will become more clear. Now, the level of clarity, there's a few factors involved, not only the type of starch or ingredients that are being used, but also the cooking method. So this could vary, but in all in all, we would call this our most translucent material. So it becomes like a really good foundation for adding in things like color or other types of um, aggregates. Now that is the same foundational material we used to produce all of these outcomes. So we've tested it, we know it's possible, and this is what we're teaching. But it, and to drive it home, it's also the same foundational material that was used to produce this series of tests. Um, and all of the fibers and granules and dyes are all the things that we have been using in our own studio um, so we are very confident that you're going to have like a successful experience. So let's get into the preparation. Okay. So we gave you a list of materials. Um, a lot of them, your first, just like your basic kitchen items. One thing that we know that you can't skip on is a spatula or something silicone so that you can mix thoroughly in your, like whatever pot you're going to use. One thing that's a very common mistake is that when you're mixing inside, you try to use like a silver spoon, but because a silver spoon, for instance, is rounded, you're not going to be able to get all the material off the bottom of the, of the pot when you mix, and that'll cause burning. So I think that's like one thing, just there's lots of options here, but I wouldn't skimp, <laughs> I wouldn't skimp on that. Um, this is the base formula. So we provided two different ways of looking at it. There is the parts version, which is on the left-hand side. And then you will see the um, actual quantity on the right. Now, during the demonstration, so that there's enough material here for you to be able to see, Paul is actually gonna be doing a thousand grams of biogel. Now, uh, we're gonna, we'll talk about parts in a moment, but essentially parts allows us to be able to scale the recipe to whatever volume you want to produce or quantity. I do want to mention that we do know that there is a difference between milliliters and grams, <laughs> and that grams as a unit of weight is different than milliliters, which is a unit of volume. Now, 
the two are the same grams and milliliters equal each other in pure water. Now, obviously we don't have pure water and that's not true, but we've found that when we're working quickly and we want to simplify things, this is the recipe we use where we just do everything by weight. Okay. And I say that because you, your own working methodology are more than welcome to, um, you know, to, to switch these over to milliliters later and have a more precise uh, method of weighing out your liquids. Um, however, this recipe has been formulated to have, let's just say some give, so that you don't have to be quite so precise. So for the sake of like time, that's why we're using grams and all this. So you will weigh out everything. Now, for those who have not used a recipe in parts before, parts represent essentially like a proportion of the total. So it allows you to scale this to whatever quantity that you want to produce. So in order to, for us, like basically when we took the parts in, in the previous slide provided you this 500 gram total biogel recipe, the quick math that we did was calculated what each part would need to be uh, in, in an actual measurement in grams to produce 100. So you do that by taking the target total, which is essentially however much you want to make, divide that by the total parts of the recipe, and then you multiply each individual ingredient by that. In this particular case, if you took the target total of 500 and divided it by 90, you end up with something like 5.56 per part. So you get, you take 5.56 times each individual ingredients as part, and you get up, you get that particular ingredients specific quantity. Now, technically, we know that if you did this math yourself, you would get something like 41.67 or 41.7 grams of potato starch. Again, the formula has some give. So you can easily round it to, to you know, 42 grams uh, since it's fairly negligible to the overall, um, at least a formula for this particular use. Are there any questions about interpreting the recipe? Cool. Okay, I take it there's some people who have baked before, so this isn't like a this is a foreign a foreign idea. Um, we have to give you some safety warnings. <laughs> uh, for those who've never used a stove before, please just be very careful. Um, if you're allergic to any of these ingredients that we've listed, please let us know. Don't try to use it if you you shouldn't. Um, there is because all the materials that we're using are fully um, are edible in most cases or, or, or totally safe. You're not going to need gloves or things like that. But, you know, there are common allergies to latex and stuff like that. So in the event that you do want to use gloves and you've never before, please just make sure that you don't have allergies to any of those kind of auxiliary um, purchases either. Um, in the chat, Wanda has a, a question about tap water versus mineral water. I'm going to say. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. So everyone's coming from every, all different places in the world. Our tap water, uh, we're located in Oregon right now and with Los Angeles previously um, the, of the U.S. So the West Coast is, you know, tap water is fine. Any, any amount of ambient material of mineral will exist, like when the water evaporates, will leave um, those minerals behind. Generally, that's when you get like um, water droplet marks like on your windows or something. It's just like the, it's just the minerals that are inside of that tap water evaporating. That is fine for what we're doing. I believe that if you're in an area where your tap water isn't visually clear or you know that there's an excessive amount of things that you need to filter out, you could go ahead and use filtered water, but you definitely don't need um, a purified water. Like a, you wouldn't need an R, a reverse osmosis and you wouldn't need distilled. And I would say that uh, having done, like made this material in LA before, uh, LA's water is very clean, but it's also uh, on the pretty high end for water hardness uh, for tap water, like in America at least, and that never caused any issues either. Cool. Um, and then also, this is like a funny thing, um, but uh, you, you'd be surprised if <laughs> you, you, you forget that the biopolymer itself is really hot when you've been cooking it <laughs> and it it kind of sticks to you because it's like sticky so 
just be cautious like after we're done producing it when you go to like transfer it into a different vessel or material that you 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 do have a stronger possibility of getting burnt because unlike hot water that kind of splashes off you this biopolymer will like adhere in a clump onto your hand or wherever it touches and kind of just continue to stay hot <laughs> for a lot longer than you want so just be cautious and even though it doesn't look hot and it's not really going to be like um, something that you are thinking about by the time you're done, you're going to be very excited to use it. Please just be very cautious about that. Okay, so we now, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to this view. Um, Paul is going to begin now. Uh, he's going to start by going the process of just weighing everything out. So based on the recipe that you have, uh, you'll be weighing out the starches. Uh, in this particular recipe, we have two. There's a potato starch and an arrowroot starch. Now we've gotten questions in the past about substituting these starches, totally possible. We probably went through a good 10 to 12 different starches when we were experimenting. They all have very different effects. Uh, we'll go into it in a second, but essentially as long as whatever starch you're using was plant-based, meaning that it had cell, there were cell walls and cellulose in the actual ingredient itself, the polymer will actually work. Now that doesn't mean that just because every starch can be used, it will actually produce good results. <laughs> so our combination of potato and arrowroot can be sort of summarized by saying that the potato starch is actually a very, very clear and produces a very transparent, like uh, transparent may, may be over exaggerating. Let's call it very, very translucent <laughs> um, biopolymer outcome but it is prone to tearing and not having a lot of durability. The arrowroot is a bit cloudy. However, when produced very cautiously, uh, the meaning that there is when you're making it, you're constantly mixing it without any burning. Andy has said that his experience, the arrowroot can actually come out pretty clear. Um, but for us, we use the arrowroot because arrowroot is very durable at the end of the day. We're providing a recipe that uses 75% potato versus 25% arrowroot. However, you are more than welcome to do a 50-50 or even 75 to the arrowroot portion and 25 to the potato starch. The main point is that the two starches combined never exceed the amount of parts in the, in the recipe. So just for clarity's sake, we're saying go ahead and use whichever distribution <clears throat> of, of potato or arrow you want, as long as the two of them add up to 10 parts out of the total 90 parts. And you can see for yourself the effect uh, of what that happens when it, cured, when it dries. So you're gonna measure everything out. I think Paul's at a place. I'm measuring out the uh, glycerin at the moment. Cool, measuring out, all right. So this is a great time while Paul is measuring to show a video of kind of what he's doing. Now, for those who haven't used scales before, this is really critical that as you weigh out each of these individual ingredients, you tear out your scales to be able to make, to reach zero before you put in the ingredient. What essentially this is doing, and I'm gonna go ahead and go back and do this again, is it's, it's allowing you to, to eliminate the weight of the actual container that you're filling such that all you're weighing is the contents that you put in that container. Now, because we're using such low volumes of certain items, like for instance, spirulina, which is an algae-based colorant, that is like using, we use that in fractions of grams. So in the event that your glass bowl Maybe you have three glass bowls, but the glass bowls vary in difference by fractions of grams. That could actually significantly throw off um, your, your outcome. So again, just make sure you turn on your scale, you stick on whatever vessel you're going to use to contain each of the ingredients, then you tear it out so it's zeroed out, and then you put in your ingredients. Cool. So this is five steps after you weigh everything out that you're gonna follow. There's a video that's gonna follow this and Paul is doing it, gonna continue doing this in the live demo. But to review, the first thing that's gonna happen is we have a pot. You see the pot kind of like in the middle view of our screen right now um, over the burner. 
We're using a glass pot so that you can see more clearly, but you can use any pot. Um, just make sure that if it does have, if it is like, for instance, a pot, an older pot that has Teflon, if the Teflon is really scratched up, those would be areas where you might worry that biopolymer would start to stick and accumulate in those scratches while you're making it. So I would maybe encourage you to use one that's like has a less like surface abrasions. But other than that, you could use pretty much any pot that you've got. Um, although it is best to try to proportionally get a pot where you have at least an inch or so of material thickness. Meaning if you're gonna do like 500 grams, don't use a really large pot that would cause you the liquid to only be you know, a quarter of an inch thick or a couple millimeters thick as that would change the way that you're using it. So just make sure you pick a proportionally sized appropriate pot. <clears throat> so the first thing you're gonna do is just pour in your water. You're then gonna add in the polymers. Adding the polymer, the polymers are the starches. Okay, so what you're going to do is Paul's adding in right now each of those starches, and we have not turned on the stove yet. Now, the starch, it's very important that you add the, the starch into the water. And part of the reason is because the starch very, very quickly sort of like condense, like starts to clump together and get and create like a really like impenetrable mat at the bottom of the water. So you'll notice as Paul's doing this, that what he's doing is he's putting in the starch and then trying to very quickly start whisking it. Now there are, there is an amount that's lost inside the bowls. If you notice, like Paul wasn't sitting there needing to like scrape the bowls out. Or on the counter. Or on the counter. But of course, this is like we're trying to make it, the recipe has some forgiveness and give. So we're okay, plus or minus a few percentage points about like the material that's actually making it in for things like the starches. Now, he's whisking that immediately to try to break up any clumps and not allow the starch to settle to the bottom of the, of the pot where it would just clump up. Now, this is where that silicone um, kind of like spatula comes in hand. You can see like, because the spatula is flat, it really like contours to the bottom of the, of the pot really making sure that you're scraping up and not leaving a layer of, um, of starch material at the bottom. Now, once it's all mixed up, and by the way, once it mixes up, it's not going to condense right away. He's turning on the heat, which is step two. Now, to begin with, it's better to stay on lower heat than higher heat. And the reason is, is that it is incredibly important that we're constantly mixing the material so that heat is evenly distributing. Now, in the event that you have too high of heat, what will happen is not, it's not necessarily just that the material will burn at the bottom, but it will also start to condense and congeal faster than the rest of the material, meaning that you'll have an inconsistency in the actual output. Now, keeping in mind that this is for extrusion purposes, so because of that, we need something that doesn't have clumps and that could actually pass easily through a nozzle that's between three and four millimeters in diameter. Just meaning that we can't have clumps that would cause the actual extruder to clog. So for that reason, while it may take longer in the beginning, we encourage you to stay lower heat until you become accustomed to the process, to which case you can increase the heat as you become more comfortable. Um, based on like anecdotal experience, uh, the more arrowroot you have in your recipe, the more likelihood it will potentially burn or clump. So if you increase the proportion of arrowroot in your starch ratio, just make sure that you're a little bit more cognizant of needing to continually stir. Now, once the stove is turned on, uh, you know, Paul already added the clear liquids because I was talking, but he added in the vinegar and the glycerin, stirring continuously and ensuring to just really drag that spatula at the bottom. And he is going to continue to do that uh, until the mixture is about to congeal, in which case, once it congeals, <clears throat> you can measure the, the, it's somewhere between 145 and 150 Fahrenheit um, that it will begin to congeal. Uh, turn off the stove 
as it will not, you do not need to continue heating. Uh, it's mostly because it'll just end up burning. Now, while he's doing it in the live demo, um, this is a condensed video. This is here for your reference. First, we're pouring in the water. We're getting our starches added in as quickly as possible, not worrying too much about the starch that sticks on to, into the bowls that didn't come out. And he's immediately whisking. You can see how the whisk is already kind of like a little struggling there. Adds in the liquids once it's all been, once the heat has been turned on. And you'll notice in this video how the spatula is really being like rubbed against the edges of the pot until it congeals. And I'm going to play, I want to show this part one more time because it's really significant. You'll see how as the, what he's doing with the spatula right now is going back and forth and around the outside edge. Part of the reason we did the glass pot is so you could really see how the spatula is truly grabbing everything that's accumulating in the corner pockets of the pot. And right here in this view, this is actually a great example down here at the bottom of where the material is starting to congeal at a rate that isn't happening in other places. So you can see how these little like bubbles are forming. <clears throat> there's, an, there's a clump that's forming, about to form. And that's the purpose of why he goes back with the spatula and like really grabs it and makes sure that it's around, it's, it's picked up and doesn't allow to burn. We're going to go over validation, but this is essentially what it'll look like once it's congealed. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? One thing I wanted to mention too is uh, that congealing process. You're, it's it's going to be kind of the consistency of milk, like you can see in the video right now, and then it will really quickly thicken, and like you're you're really going to feel that change with the spatula. True. Yeah, it's a good point. So, what's going on now? I encourage anyone who's interested, especially if you come from a background or have interest in like understanding the science behind where and how polymerization is occurring. But essentially the short and sweet of it all is that we're using plant-based starches. So they inherently are made of cellulose polymers. Basically, you can see in the right hand, like basic what's down here, this would be a polymer, you know, a, a chain essentially of sugar molecules of glucose. Now, each of those chains are connected through, uh, if you were to zoom into this, I don't think you can see, there's actually like these dashed connections. And these are the connections that are gonna be prone to dissolving upon contact with an acid. Now, in our particular setup, vinegar is functioning as the acid here. So we introduce a polymer, the water, that we're heating functions as the solvent, which is essentially, let's just call it like a liquid matrix that allows these broken apart bits to free float and, re, and reformulate uh, and reconnect. Now, the vinegar, as we said, once we introduce that into the hot water with the starch, is then going to go through and the acid is going to begin to break up the polymer chains, causing each of the woes once an interconnected chaining group of the cellulose into individual glucose molecules. And from there, it allows them to reorganize within the solvent of the water into a new actual like biopolymer structure. The glycerin in this case functions as a plasticizer that allows the material variability in both the way in its flexibility. Um, now let's just say for colloquial terms by lubricating the, um, the molecule connections. Okay, and in this case, like quantity of glycerin, just like differences in proportion of starch, will dramatically affect the way that the uh, the recipe and the formula produces an outcome. So, actually, just to come back up, oh, go ahead, yeah, Andy, got something. Uh, Varun has a question. I oh, yeah, a raised hand on your. Thank you. Sorry. Please go ahead and uh, what's your question? Oh, and hello, um, by the way. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, so I had a question that uh, once uh, once the mixture is ready and it's hot and we are essentially putting it in an extruder, right, after that. And um, 
so does it need to be hot when it's put into the pipe because i you know it it has to become a solid at some point and i i could not understand how that process happens sure no that's a good question so we will huh ah, paul's congealing <laughs> it's going on in the background on the side um yeah Varun, it's um essentially the short answer is that you'll allow it to cool to a point to it it's safe to handle uh the mixture that we have we're going to show like very rarely are you going to just use this base polymer and the reason is because like this would only be for use in an application where you want something that's clear or translucent depends on like the starches but in most cases you're also introducing some sort of aggregate and we're going to get into that next a fiber granule or some sort of pigment and dye when you add in those aggregates it actually changes the structure of uh or the mechanical let's just say the mechanical performance of the gel in such a way that things like adding in fibers will actually prevent the biopolymer from ever fully solidifying into a solid some of those experiments like well we're going to talk about that and we're going to show you a little bit of validation to that but essentially this mixture will maintain some level of like plasticity in its gel form until cooling now you can still it's like there's an increased amount of like um force that's required to extrude something that's colder than something that's hotter but it's still within the realm of like what every average extruder can do so the extruder that we're using for instance is a clay extruder and we use about one-tenth the required force than what extruding clay is required, even when the biopolymer is cold and has been in the extruder for like a week. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Great. Okay. So um, let's see. Okay. So I just wanted to like say one thing before we go back, which is like to hammer home why we talk a little bit about what's actually going on is so that you have some authority over understanding what you can alter in this recipe. So we've already talked about keeping starch in a similar ratio, but being able to substitute starches or substitute the ratio of starches. Um, although we are more comfort comfortable with you substituting the ratio of potato and arrowroot, you are also more than welcome to try your own kind of starch but we have no ability to understand exactly what the outcome will be. Um, but you should explore those kinds of things on your own. But the vegetable glycerin down here, now that we've like sort of considered this or thought about this as a plasticizer, um, we should, you should be able to understand that you can adjust the parts. So right now our recipe uses five parts of glycerin. You could easily reduce that down to two or three parts and get something that's a lot more rigid, potentially too brittle. Uh, and you could also increase it to something like seven parts or eight parts, where it will become incredibly flexible. However, you will know that you get to that maximum because the outcome that you get once dried will be something that may not have very much um, durability and will also likely be slightly greasy. However, in all situations, which we'll talk about a bit later about like how to set up your, your experimentation, um, the three of us believe in kind of like a rule of threes, the way that you test. So like when we're gonna test, like let's say this rest, the recipe that we showed you here, <clears throat> there, there were versions to which we altered one variable where we're like, okay, this is our base. This is our like standard kind of like formula. But we're going to try a version where we decrease vegetable glycerin. We're going to also try a version at the same time that decreases vegetable glycerin to two and increases vegetable glycerin to eight. We'll let all, we'll sand, we'll extrude out by hand, which is another thing we'll get to. So a quick test in our own, those three different tests. We'll label them, keep the formulas labeled as well. And when they're done, we'll be able to assess the impact of that one variable. So it may turn out, for instance, that when all other things in the formula are the same, just all changing the vegetable glycerin to two produces a very like hard um, sheet surface that has some good applications, 
maybe five vegetable glycerin is ideal for a semi um, flexible biopolymer outcome. Whereas eight vegetable glycerin might produce a very, very wet feeling um, limp sort of a membrane surface, which the applications and reasons for wanting to use these things is totally project based. So there are times where we've made samples that we thought were totally uh, useless, like too brittle, breaks into pieces. Then years later, we end up having like a project where, man, we need a surface texture of this like brittle exterior. We go back into our records and then we're able to find that formula and we keep that sample that's been labeled and be able to reference that. And that becomes part of like our material library. But at the same time, it also teaches us the effect of altering the parts within that vegetable glycerin. Cool. So that is why we have that part of the process. Okay, so the question is, how do we know that what we've made is good? So there's methods, uh, any method, in fact, that would allow you to extrude out a bead, a bead being the name for this sort of like linear long line. Um, we're looking for like a few things here. One is like, we're looking to see that there isn't like an excessive amount of bubbles that are inside of this extrusion. And if there were, you would see bubbles popping and that you wouldn't see a clean line. We're obviously doing this by hand, or I don't know if we're obviously, but we did this by hand and we did it with a, a, uh, an Amazon, like large, I think it's a hundred, what size is that? Uh, 150 milliliters. Okay, 150 milliliter syringe. And we use this because our extruder has an opening that's about four millimeters, which is about the same identical size as this, the opening of this, um, uh, of the syringe. So we know that when we're pushing it out the, as the material extrudes, if the bead itself looks good, we are, can anticipate that we're in like a really close zone for when we begin 3D printing for success. But a couple things to mention, if you look at the side of the bead, you'll see that the bead in profile is holding its own shape. If it looks like it's collapsing, then the bead is more like a, it's too watery or too liquidy. And that may be because either you didn't uh, keep it on the heat stirring long enough, or because somewhere along the line, there was a possibility that you, maybe uh, an ingredient wasn't measured out fully properly. Um, but in most cases, the formula we provided should produce something that looks like it's a semi-rounded profile. You can almost see how like where the bead touches the ground or it touches this like surface that it's almost like undercut. Like as in like the footprint of the bead seems slightly smaller than the overall thickness of the bead. And that just means that the bead is holding its own without collapsing. And we'll see, we'll come back to this like in a bit. But I do want to show like this is if your bead comes out looking like this, you're really close to something that's fully extrudable. I know this is subjective, so please tell me if there's something that you um, want to, you need further clarification on. So I'll, uh, this is also another good point. We, we like to work in a way where we don't require significant amounts of like measuring equipment to assess validation. And in general, even in ultra large companies that are doing innovation research, there isn't a lot of like need to produce, to use high sophisticated technology to test the efficiency of material until it passes what one could call just like a basic smell test. Like, can we observe things that will teach us that there are fundamental properties that are working properly that would tell us whether or not we're even close to something. More precision later down the line would require more instrumentation, but that doesn't mean that we can't already assess these things. So part of the reason that we're talking like visually explaining what this bead should look like is because one, the liquid process is already one that's less precise than things like thermoplastics. We don't need highly precise deposition because the liquid material itself 
sort of infills gaps and imprecision. But second off, it's just more efficient to be able to quickly test and visually inspect and see that we're getting success rates before relying on like external measuring equipment. So again, we're gonna do this a few times where we're looking at things just saying, look at this picture, look at how it flows, look at the control uh, to which it extrudes. So we'll do one more time. You'll notice that it's clearly coming out at the end of the nozzle and expanding slightly. and coming out in a controlled bead in a straight line. And at this point, if it does that, we're good to go. All right, so we're moving on to customization. All right, so I would say that probably most of what we test is different things to customize. And while there are different ways that we maybe can like attribute success, there is no end to like what it is, um, that you can add into the biopolymer. Everything from in the top left is like the introduction of some sort of like metal mesh um, through different types of aggregates, colorants, earth-based dyes and not. So for us to try to like find a way to articulate this in some means that would help you identify the different methodologies of working with each of these uh, additives, we've divided it into three categories, pigments and dyes, granules and fibers. So these are like some examples of just how some of these additives would come. Uh, Clay-based would be something more like a granule. You would get that from those possibilities from ceramic locations. Amazon, for those who have like Amazon in your country, is capable of delivering many of these items, including things like algae-based spirulina, which is the blue in the bottom left. This is generally used in cooking as a... Um, as a healthy means of introducing blue pigmentation into different types of like foods. Now, things like irons, these would be um, earth-based pigments. Um, and these are all fully accessible from, of course, ceramic locations, but also different types of pigments are being sold for things like facial um, cleansers. And I've also seen them in arts and crafts locations. So I would say like, um, we're gonna just cover a few of them really quick, but just keep in mind that we're attempting to categorize these into the three customization types solely based on how you deal with them by making them, not categorized by performance or categorized by actual sourcing types. Those, the things that you saw in the previous slide are the things that help yield the materials that we have here. And we store them personally, um, either in liquid form or in powder form. So first quickly, pigments and dyes, basically the same thing. A dye is usually just a pigment that hasn't been dehydrated into a powder. So you can, you can use them in either way. One thing though, is that you might have to adjust for the quantity of liquid. Uh, in the event that you're using a dye over a pigment, you may want to reduce the amount of water that you put in the original base gel so that that way when you add in your dye, we don't end up with some with a gel that's too liquidy at the end. But again, this doesn't have to be super precise. Water does not have any actual chemical um, effect on the biopolymer. It is just the solvent agent that will eventually evaporate leaving behind only um, the materials that aren't water-based. So even if you add too much water, you're not really hurting things other than making it impossible when you 3D print to keep that self-contained um, bead. Okay, so this is how we get the different pigmentations here. The steps are pretty simple as follows. The reason that we start with the base biopolymer is because after you have the base bio, biopolymer produced, and this can be hot, this can be still in the pot, all you would need to do is add in your pigments and stir. Pretty easy. So we thought since that was pretty self-explanatory, we actually wanted to tell, show you how it is that we produce gradients. Um, and so what we do for gradients is we essentially... And I'm just summarizing what's already written here, but this is here for your, your, your own reference, is that 
The base gel is the one to the farthest to the right. That's what's over here, the one that's currently lightest. We know that this, once dry, will become clear. What we do is we take that base gel and we divided it into two. One that we put in our darkest quantity of spirulina, mixed it by hand, and you, you get with you a dark blue. Only after that, we take half the dark blue and half of what's lightest blue and mix them together in the middle. So the reason we do that is because for us, the gradient is a visual um, exercise in the, for testing purposes. It's always easier because of the potency of things like pigments like spirulina to mix sort of like a concentrated color gel first and then take amounts of that color gel and mix it into others to produce lighter tones. It is not advised to attempt to weigh out the spirulina in quantities that would produce the correct colors that you're looking for in these small values, just because this middle blue spirulina could require only one or two grams. I'm sorry, this middle like light blue. And it is almost impossible <laughs> to measure in those small amounts and reproduce it accurately. In larger quantities where instead of one to two grams of spirulina, it might be like five grams of spirulina, that might be more realistic. So we just wanted to mention here that this is how, this is our method for mixing colors. You get your, your lightest, you use the base material and produce a concentrate, and then you mix those together to produce whatever variations in between. Now, what we're gonna be doing later is that we're gonna be basically sequencing the way that we load these biopolymers into the extruder, which in this case, our handheld extruder would be a syringe. So we do this by putting in our lightest, our medium, and our darkest last. It is important to note that in almost all extrusion circumstances, we want the darkest to be last, mostly because in no matter what extruder you're using, unless you've got a really high-end extruder with a very reliable auger at the end, some amount of dark material will always get stuck around the nozzle. So if you printed dark blue first, everything you print afterward would have a streak of dark blue. So we always start with our lightest and then end with our darkest. And just like we did testing for validation in the base biopolymer, we do the same thing here where we just print it or we just extrude it out consecutive rows to test to make sure that what we have looks good. And you can see a clear gradient that's coming out from those three original um, biopolymer mixtures. So in a nutshell, that is sort of like what we think you should, you, it's a starting point for like easy experimentation and exploration to get some level of sequenced color shifting through a single print extrusion. Ultimately in the future, it's always lovely. Like we, you could have a multi-chamber 3D printer where you could do everything independently. But for those who have one extrude, like one tube extruder, this is the best method for us not only to get a gradient of color, but later this will be the same method to use for a gradient of multi-materiality. Where Grasshopper will come in is that Grasshopper will help us determine the quantities that we should fill the tubes in such that when it's printed with a 3D printer, that type of material is being deposited in sequence with motion in the way of the design of our swatch. But we'll get to that. But of course, we're always trying to link handheld uh, or, or hand testing with something that we know we can automate later. Okay, two more left. So we got granules. We have kaolin uh, as one granule. We also have like a, a black um, sand as a second granule. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of tell you what's going on here. What's going to happen is like we use a blender for all granules and we highly suggest a real blender, not a handheld mixer. There is a level of like intensity of blending that is required to make this work. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to make your bio, your base gel. Again, this is a branch. So pick there's pigmentation as one option. Pigment and dyes, another option is this. You can see that there was 
already biopolymer added to the bottom of the blender, you can see how small amounts are difficult to do in a blender. So you'll have to, based on your own blender, figure out the minimum. For us, I think it's like a 200 grams of material is the minimum that our blender can take. But it's as simple, or at least in this case, as simple as putting in the base biopolymer amount, pre-measuring out how much kaolin you want to add, and adding in that granule, mixing for a bit, using the spatula to clean the sides, and then remixing again until the outcome looks something like this. You'll see that there is consistency. You'll see that it's holding its own shape. It's almost like peanut. Well, no, it's not like peanut. Well, I guess everyone's peanut butter is different. Um, <laughs> but it's like a, it's like a, it's so funny to try to find analogies across multiple countries, <laughs> especially since our Jif peanut butter is definitely not the same as, um, as like a natural peanut butter. But anyway, it looks like this. That's why we're providing videos. We validate it similarly by loading it into some method of testing out a manual extrusion and making sure that when we cross over the print, you can see a clear delineation of one bead stacked top another. Now, one of the benefits of things like adding in clays like kaolin is that it begins to somewhat self-level. So you'll see how the second pass, and I'm gonna go ahead and replay this. The first pass stays as a nice bead and stays pretty intact. Once you go back over that pass, you'll see how the second layer begins to almost like flatten and form and self-level into the first. When this is all dry, this will produce a very like, a very, um, the, the two layers will be very firmly attached. Uh, but this would be how a visual validation for exactly how this extrusion layer should look. Just to make, like, just to make it really extra clear on one side is what we'd call very bad. And this is only because we're trying to extrude. There are many projects out there where what we're labeling bad for this application could look phenomenal on. Sheet material, a surface for something. So it's not inherently bad. It's just that for extrusion, we would worry about the extruder clogging and there being inconsistency in the material. So what we're looking for is something like the right-hand side where we, where we have a very like, um, homogeneous mixture. Wait. Sorry here. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I confused myself. So we're a little, this is a little out of order, but we can follow along here. Essentially, while we've been using a syringe this whole time, there are other methods. And one of these methods is you take a bag and you cut the corner of that bag and use it as an extruder. The other is that you order syringes, like they could be medical syringes or non-medical syringes off of some like some sort of like online source or from like a science distributor. Or for those who come baking or have access to like grocery stores where there are baking sections, you can also pick up pastry bags. The importance here is not that there's a, well, there will be a difference with each of these in terms of attempting to do gradients. I'm sure it can be like understood that if you were to use a syringe, there's a clear way to laminate clear, medium, and dark, whereas that might get mixed up a bit, a bit in the plastic bag or within the pastry bag. However, those are both totally reliable options to follow. And I'm pretty sure an example of those will come up very soon. But in the short term, the question was, was also what other kinds of granules can be added. In this case, what you're seeing is a granule that is, was added with a uh, with sand. That sand you can see first with the plastic bag, next with the syringe, and last with the pastry bag. And you can see that regardless of like the different type like ways of deploying this, they still all produce a bead that can be assessed for um, validation of the material type. And even with a granule as thick as the one that you see here to the right with the sand, uh, the validation is still the same. You can still see the chunks in the biopolymer, but the biopolymer is homogeneous and not creating these like really excessive clumps that could block the extruder. Okay, last up, fibers. Fibers is fun. 
We love fiber. Um, fiber produces probably one of the most durable um, biopolymer outcomes that you can have. You can actually, and it also generally is very beautifully um, textured. In general, the only difference here is that we're gonna have to pre-prep some sort of like fiber before we put it in. Just as an overview before I start this section's video, uh, we're using a pre a pre-torn up paper pulp, which you see in the upper bowl. Now you can do this with toilet paper. You can do this with any form of fiber-based paper, including even just white paper. There are different methods to getting the raw paper pulp, most of which can be like, you can refer to like DIY paper making tutorials, but generally you tear up things like newspaper or something, put it in a blender, blend it up in water, and then just squeeze out the excess material. I only wanted to just make sure you know, we're using paper pulp from a ceramic supplier. So it was already kind of like pre-torn up and that's why ours looks this way. We're using, we're combining fiber with a, with a pigment or a granule-like pigment, which we're gonna use biochar <clears throat> to produce this. So we have our three ingredients, just like the other two customizations, you start with the base biopolymer gel. And then we add in and prepare our aggregate. So this video is the process for, for first wetting the pulp, dumping in the biochar, which I think we just watered down there, using a strainer to pour out the mixture. And by the way, this was for the sole purpose of taking that white fiber and giving it a tone of gray. And that was because you can leave the fibers their original color, but you will see that color come through in the final uh, material. And just like with the granules, you're gonna use a blender to add the fiber into the biopolymer. After blending appropriately, which might take a little while, including scraping the sides and restarting blending, you should end up with this like really beautiful mixture. Now questions, you know, about like what its applications are can extend to increased quantities of fiber. Like let's say in this case, four times the amount of fiber per biopolymer can be used to make three-dimensional objects like this sort of like block <laughs> that we have here. Um, <clears throat> all the way down to less quantities of fiber like we showed producing the good on the right. Realizing we missed the label here. The left-hand side, very bad. That would be an example of fiber that has been attempted to be mixed with a handheld mixer or not mixed long enough in the um, blender. Whereas the homogeneous option on the right is the ideal um, way that fiber-based material should look. Again, we chose to do this with biochar, which is why it's black. However, there's no reason you can do this with other forms of pigmentation. Like in this particular case, spirulina was used. Um, there's a combination of multiple materials here. Uh, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the dark blue here is a fiber-based with spirulina. Yeah. Yeah. There was also um, in that dark blue, the, the fiber was uh, just like natural hemp uh, in individual strands rather than like tied into a rope. Cool. Uh, and to conclude, again, we just wanted to, because these are, these are references for you later, some of these are repeating slides, just to give you a sense of like, these are the way that we test. Having known now exactly what makes the formula, it should be fairly clear that the opacity that's being altered here are proportions of the starch, whereas flexibility here is proportions and parts of glycerin. And by altering the chemical, the formula in those two ways is the exact way that we um, we actually achieved the difference between these three tests that we did on our own. Now, in these cases, in the event that you don't have extruders or you don't have something to be able to test in linear beads, um, and you still just want to test with biopolymers or for a different application, you can pour these biopolymers into frames like you see here, or into other small um, vessels like maybe petri dishes or whatnot and be able to test out your formulas and sheet material without needing to extrude it 
In this particular case, the three examples that you see were versions that we had poured into small squares to test. These were done with a, um, with a uh, syringe. Um, and in this particular case, I'm hoping it's also clear, we're changing opacity not just by not just altering the starches, but by adding in biochar as aggregates and also altering its flexibility by, in addition to adding in different amounts of biochar, adding a different amount of glycerin. Um, tomorrow, we are gonna go into more detail about exactly what a toolpath is, but we are highly, um, we, we are suggesting to everybody who learns any of these kinds of things that in the event that you can get a hold of a syringe or a pastry bag or a bag and want to test out some way of extruding your material into patterning, that you start with something as simple as a line work, which on the right hand side of this is from at a grasshopper, but we're going to provide something similar, which is just like line work. You put down a piece of like wax paper so you can see through it or, uh, or some sort of different, you know, <clears throat> silicone mat or whatnot, and you attempt to trace these patterns, uh, even by hand. And even without having like an extruder or like a 3D printer, you can still result, like produce um, results and material tests that will heavily inform and anticipate the way that the material will work once extruded. And so we're gonna go over that, but for now, in the event that you wanna get going, we're suggesting you start with a four millimeter spacing between lines. Um, that doesn't mean there's four millimeters between the extrusion. It just means that the lines that you're tracing are four millimeters apart. And if that's the case, the, the biopolymer should touch each other in the same way that you see in the image here. Okay, so having said all that, are there any questions about anything here? Um, it looks like uh, Roshni has a question about making sheet goods with okay. the biopolymers. Uh, there's this, uh, if we were to make a sheet with the material, what would the setting time, what would be the setting time? Uh, or is there a time, way to catalyze the process of setting? Andy, I feel like you know that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, so typically it's going to take, depending on how thick your sheet is, it's probably going to take between four days and like a week. Uh, it would be best if you're doing a sheet also, like once it's, the top is gonna dry much faster than the bottom because it's exposed to more air. So I would say after maybe three days, you wanna flip it. Um, in general, most of these prints are gonna take about that amount of time uh, and you'll, you'll want to flip partway through. Um, you can speed it up by putting it in the oven so you don't you you want it to be at about 160 Fahrenheit. Let me see what that is in uh, centigrade. But I think it's oh expensive. yeah, we should have put centigrade too. We forget the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so about 70 C um, in the oven for about like six to eight hours. Um, so you want it to you don't want to heat it too quickly because what happens is you have the top surface or the the very outside is going to dry much much faster than the inside you're going to get a lot more cracking you're going to get a lot more tearing so something pretty much as low as your oven can go i know that uh, most american ovens can't go lower than 150 or like 65 c um but that's going to be the fastest way to to dry this stuff uh, someone else is also asking, does the material get contaminated easily or no considerations needed? Um, I know that if you're leaving, so the material, if it's not exposed to a lot of air, is not going to dry out. You can keep it in a, in a jar for a long period of time, some kind of airtight container. Um, I've had about half of an extruder tube full of this material for the past like two three weeks it's still completely usable i can keep running the extruder um because the only air it's getting is just at the very point of the nozzle it can mold uh if there's if there's a lot of excess water content in your mix afterwards especially if you're using something like uh if you're if you're putting in a lot of paper pulp it can mold so 
Um, I don't think that I've ever tried putting it in the fridge. I don't know if you if oh yeah, we we have a lot. Yeah, you can do that too. Okay. Because because we the reason we ended up making a base and then altering it was because we were working on some projects that were relying on making like a gallon or two at a time. Yeah. Like and you we would use maybe only a fraction of that per sitting. So what we do is like just stick it in a big pot and then just stick that in the fridge. The cool thing, which I should have said, was like when you blend and you add in an aggregate, even if like uh, the, the gel, when you put it in a fridge, is going to kind of like solidify into what I can only describe as like jello. <laughs> it's like you can literally like scoop it and it comes out and it looks just like jello. That's obviously going to be more difficult to extrude at that point. But if you add in like an aggregate and blend or something like that, it loosens it up. The only thing though is that it would be better if you knew what aggregate you're going to use to make it with the aggregate and store it that way. And part of the reason is while it's hot um, and while it's been congealing, it's reformulating all of those, like it's re it's reattaching all those molecules um, into a new kind of like biopolymer strand. Once you like cool it, it becomes jello-like because it's everything's legitimately becoming more static, which means that there's no new molecules that are connecting anymore. So ideally, what you try to do is you try to do all the mixing and blending that you need to do while it's fairly warm after it comes out so that everything is still free moving. And once it's blended with your granules or your um, fibers, the molecules can still begin, you know, still reattach to some degree while, the, while it's still free moving. Um, but anyway, that's a long answer to say you can definitely store these things. Everything's good for as long as you want. You may just have to test whether or not it's better to blend everything with your, your additives before storing it or after storing it, depending on your workflow. Um, there was also a period in time where we were using like a really weak extruder. Um, and it's also worth noting that we would like just reheat it. <laughs> like we would stick the mixture kind of like back on the stove and kind of like re-add some warmth to it and that kind of made it more viscous again and then we put it into the extruder later <clears throat> and I, I guess one thing we also didn't mention was that um part of the reason we put baking sheets like like non-stick baking sheets on the list was because you can extrude onto those non-stick baking sheets or onto a silicone mat put it in your oven at that low percentage degrees and then that way you can help dehydrate the, um, the sample if you don't have like a dehydrator or you don't have the time to let it sit out for a while. But as the water evaporates, actual, in general, especially with this formula, mass is actually evaporating. So funny thing, we should add this in before we, we send this out to everyone. Your samples shrink, <laughs> generally. Like until you find the right aggregate, um, samples will shrink. Part of the reason we like fibers is because the fibers cross and instead of shrinking and getting smaller, it shrinks and gets flatter. So you're also going to notice that as you explore with different kinds of like additives, the way that the material sets up is going to be different um, than just the base biopolymer itself drying. We're going to go into this a little bit more later and definitely during the session we can do some troubleshooting but do not get discouraged if your first few prints kind of tear themselves apart as they attempt to shrink and dry. Most of the time, that's just because you either need an aggregate in there to help make it more durable, increase air root so it's a little more durable, or you need to have a surface that you're printing on that's a little more slick and a little more nonstick so that it doesn't catch when it's trying to shrink. Uh, so I, I know that one of the other um, kind of surfaces that we that we've done tests on before is like wax paper um, or if you want to put it in the oven or parchment paper but one of the issues with that is that as it does shrink it can cause the paper to wrinkle and then it cause your print to wrinkle um, it's if, if that doesn't really matter to your test like you're, you want to just knock out a bunch of tests and like, cover a table with them leave it leave it for a week then that's that, that's fine but uh, it's something to keep in mind uh, Julia, you have a question? 
I, yeah, um, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, it's really interesting, really great. Um, I was wondering, um, I'm not sure if I missed this, but I was wondering if you could uh, discuss a little bit like what performance uh, value like adding Kalen adds in or other granules. And then I was also curious, I think you mentioned that um, adding uh, paper pulp or other fibers is sort of what at what allows um, like taller prints or three dimensional prints. And I guess I was wondering if you could um, discuss like whether it's possible to achieve higher prints without fibers in your experience or if fibers are always necessary. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a really good question. So in general, it's just sort of like about thinking about how the aggregate performs <clears throat> structurally. Fibers are great because the fibers actually like cross laminate each other in a way that provides sort of like strength in all directions. Granules, as you can imagine, because there's just like a bunch of these like small semi round objects sitting adjacent to each other. There's not actually anything that's overlapping. So it doesn't produce as strong of an outcome. I guess you could think about fibers in the same way that you would use literal fiberglass. Like the actual orientation of the, of the fiber inside between the resin is what gives fiberglass strength in those particular ways. It's not necessarily just the resin. So if we think about it in that analogy, actually the biopolymer is functioning the same as the resin and the aggregate is functioning just the same as those like fiber strips that are being put in the fiberglass. They work simultaneously. Concrete, same deal. We're kind of thinking of like cement, same as biopolymer, and granules as the aggregate. Cement has very little like um, tensile strength. It's very, it's much more about something that's compressive. And I think that thinking about the way that you're adding in aggregates for use cases with those analogies is actually probably pretty accurate. <laughs> So it's like, well, if you're attempting to produce something that's going to it with need to withstand forces in many directions, granules would not be the best choice. Fibers would be, because purely of the way that they like they cross each other and produce strength in multiple ways. So is it possible to produce something that doesn't use it to 3D print? Totally. Like people do it. But in general, I would say it's not things like sand. It's things like, um, things like, let's say I've seen versions of what looks like snippets of hay, <laughs> like uh, long form tubes, but conceptually the way the tubes kind of cross each other functions very similarly to the way that fibers do. We've also seen people who have put in things like small pieces of wood, uh, there are tons of non-plant-based biopolymer experimentations that include all sorts of things that include even human hair <laughs> as a as an as the aggregate that they add in for that kind of strength um i would say that we have not explored that um in general though it's not one or the other actually i think some of our favorite outcomes were mixing granules and fiber together and getting that right kind of consistency that stacks well with the compressive strength, but then has the fibers that help it once it's cured to like really be um, more durable. Um, from a performance standpoint, that would kind of be like the most I'd be comfortable like saying in a way that feels authoritative, <laughs> but like in general, with any authority, I mean, but I guess like the, uh, but I would suggest that if you have a use case, setting up your testing sequence to try to address that head on is the best. So if you said that's what your goal is, I would say, I would suggest you do a test where you try just fiber and take a syringe and just try to start extruding upward. Try a test where you do fiber and a certain percentage of an aggregate, a granule, and see, you know, there's two ways to validate. One is, does it extrude properly? But the second is what happens when it's dry. And so they're both equally important. So it may turn out that like the granules are actually like primarily a means for producing a durable bead that can be stacked multiple tall 
can produce a three-dimensional form. And that's its purpose, you know? And then the actual performance comes from the fibers when it's been dried. And you would need to set yourself up in a way that you could find a common way to test that. Maybe it would be in, in instances for us, like when we're testing durability, one common use is like with a crane scale. That's like, uh, a lot of people use it to like weigh their luggage. It's like basically just a scale that instead of having to put weight on it, it is a hook that you hang from. And that's a way to kind of test like you clamp down one side of your material, you clamp down the other and you put a certain amount of weight on it and you keep adding on weight <laughs> until the thing tears apart. And then that gives you like a quantifiable, repeatable test that you can continue to put each of your samples on to figure out whether or not you're achieving more or less strength in the ways that you require. And of course, I think it's pro probably pretty easy to understand how setting up something like that could then be taken into a more professional lab. And the same thing would be done, which is like a higher degree of precision but it would still be the same kind of like um, testing uh, setup. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, Andy, did you have anything? that you wanted to prepare anyone for, for tomorrow? Um, well, I think if anybody wants to be using the Grasshopper script, there's a couple of plugins that we're gonna need. Um, I think you, uh, you brought those plugins up in your first presentation. Mm -hmm. I compiled those into a zip folder that is in the uh, Google Drive that we sent to you, there's a, a Grasshopper folder and those plugins are in there. And so I could go over right now installing those for anybody that needs help. Cool, so maybe what we could do is, um, we, I think we're mostly done and anyone who wants to stick around to learn how to put in the plugins can do that. Um, but otherwise, thank you everyone. Uh, again, if you have personal projects or you have anything you wanna share, throw it on the mural board so everyone can see and we'll we'll take a look at it tomorrow in case there's anything new there. Uh, I think everyone comes from this really interesting background. So whatever work you're doing or anything you're interested in, throw it up there. Uh, we all know that Zoom is a little bit of an isolating kind of experience. So any way that we could get more people to share their work is great. <laughs> um, and also any testing that you do, uh, we do have a support session. But if you begin testing and hit problems, please throw up some pictures of what your problem is on the mirror board, send an email, and um, we'll, be, we'll be helping the most that we can throughout the week anyway. Cool. Um, yeah, so maybe- uh... Oh, do you have a name? Oh, you're on the webcam. Wait, oh, you got, I, you're not a, oh, I'm sorry. Paul's supposed to be there that whole time. No, <laughs> so, anyway, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow unless you want help with um, doing the plugins. Mm -hmm. And I just want to um, uh, be clear. You will not be able to run uh, the G-code scripts that we're giving or the Grasshopper scripts that we're giving you without these plugins. Uh, so if you do want to do any testing with those at all, and you need help installing plugins, please stick around because uh, this will definitely speed things up tomorrow when we're going over those. Cool. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. And uh, I'll jump into that uh, just quick plugin installation tutorial. Cool. Okay. I guess we could put it's in, is it in the drive? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. So we can go There's on a zip folder in the drive um, under Grasshopper. And that is that's going to contain the all the plugins that we're going to be using. I know that you mentioned uh, anemone and what was it? Uh, uh, fish. Uh, yeah. But I'm also adding human in there. Human is good for uh, visualization and things like that, just in case um, anybody wants to do that at the end.
And so please, if you have, if you don't have those, uh, if you don't have those plugins yet and you haven't downloaded that uh, folder, please go and download that. I'm gonna copy the link in here as well, just in case, you know, make things go a little bit faster. And then before you start uh, installing the plugins, I there's a there is something that you have to typically do with Grasshopper plugins before you use them. I'm going to share screen really quick. Oh. Um, I think I need to be given permission to share screen. Okay, let me uh, figure that out, Andy. Okay, you should be able to now. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to pull up that folder really quick. So this is what the folder looks like once you unzip it. Uh, there's uh, pufferfish, anemone, and human. Uh, human and anemone are both one step, but uh, pufferfish is just is just like three steps. Um, but what I want to make sure before you guys copy these over um, is. Sometimes these files will have some kind of a block here. If you click on the file and you go to, down to properties, uh, sometimes it'll, it'll have a block here and you'll need to, uh, to check to unblock the file. I did that to all of the ones before I sent them, but it's possible that in transferring them, your computer will kind of see them as a, as a possible issue and, and re-block those files. So just make sure to go through anemone, human and then also if you go into pufferfish there's another of these gha files and you want to go through all of them and make sure that none of them have a block down here because then it won't work and it won't give you any other like warnings why and it'll be confusing so first step to installing these is we want to open grasshopper and so in rhino you can just type in grasshopper and it will load up the grasshopper window. I've got a ton of plugins, so mine always takes a ton of a while to load up for the first time. There we go. So grasshopper will look like this. And to get to the place that we need to put these files, we're going to go to File. We're going to go down here to Special Folders, and then the Components folder. Um, and this is going to work for Rhino 6 or 7. Uh, these All the plugins will work. This sort of installation uh, method is going to work for all of those. But you're going to want to take your human and anemone files, you can copy them, and then just paste them into here. I'm not gonna do that because I already have those files, but you wanna paste them in here uh, and you wanna see that it says grasshopper libraries. And then once those are pasted, we're gonna grab the same GHA file from the pufferfish folder, and then also just copy and paste that into this uh, libraries folder. And then we can close that. And then we're gonna go back to Grasshopper because we need a second folder for uh, the rest of Pufferfish. So in the Pufferfish folder, there's this Pufferfish sub D components. We're not really gonna be using any of them, but it, it'll just show up as a weird blank in your Grasshopper if you don't install these. So we're gonna go through here and then we're going to copy all of the um, uh, all of the GH user files that are here and
copy. And then we can go into Grasshopper again and go back to special folders and then user object folder. And we're going to paste them here. And you can see I already have them in here. And those should need those should never be uh, blocked. So you shouldn't need to check those for that. And then you can close that. And then we want to fully close out of Grasshopper and Rhino. And then when you reopen Grasshopper, you should see those uh, plugins as new toolbars up above. So back in Rhino, Grasshopper. Okay, so in, for me, for example, Pufferfish is now showing up here and Anemone is showing up here. So this is where you want to see those. And you don't want to see any like blanks or um, little warning triangles or anything like that saying that something's missing. If you don't see these, uh, it's likely that the files were still blocked or maybe they weren't uh, pasted incorrectly, but, uh, and you'll want to redo those parts and then close down and restart Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, is anyone, does anyone have a question or, or is anybody, is anybody having trouble with one of the, one of the steps? Okay, well, looks like everybody's good. I don't see any uh, hands up or anything. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is pretty quick. I'm sure that uh, many of you have already put in Grasshopper plugins before and know how to do it. Um, yeah, but if, if if anybody has any questions before we go over the Grasshopper scripts tomorrow, um, you know, feel free to reach out and we can make sure that you have all the software that you need to, to run that. Okay. Um, just like as a reminder to those who are still there that our contacts are on Miro. If you have a question after the session and before tomorrow's session, you can reach out then. Okay. Uh, well, uh, then we will see everyone tomorrow. And thank you, Andy. That was great and very helpful. And uh Great to great to meet everybody today, and we're you know we're really excited to be doing this workshop with everybody. Yes, thank you for saying that. <laughs> okay, uh, well we'll see. Wow. You All right, bye. Let me.